Hello everyone and welcome to Kabbalah Explained Simply. Uh, I'm Leo, your host, your instructor for tonight. And tonight, uh, Kabbalah Explained Simply is uh, going to be very special. It's always special, but this one is extremely special because it is about the appearance of the Ari. Uh, so if you've been studying for a while and you've heard of the Ari, hopefully this will help uh, position him in the right place. If you've never studied Kabbalah and you're here for the first time and you want to hear more about Kabbalah, uh, it, this will open a window for you into what is um, collectively called Lurianic Kabbalah, which is different than different uh, other different types of Kabbalah that's been uh, studied and practiced throughout the ages. Uh, Lurianic Kabbalah, the Kabbalah that started after the Ari, marked a very uh, significant change from everything that preceded it and uh, this is the Kabbalah that we are studying here in Bnei Baruch. and it will help you understand a little bit uh, more the historic context of this Kabbalah, what makes it unique, what makes it special for our times and it will also maybe give you a little taste of some of the basic concepts that we're dealing with Again, don't be uh, surprised, confused, concerned. If you hear something that is totally new, that's okay. Uh, in the chat, we have our uh, amazing support team. They're going to point you in the right direction. If you're just starting out, they'll send you to... Uh, uh, we have some amazing uh, beginner classes that would put you, uh, help you take the first step on your journey. And if you're already on this path, then... Great, you already know what to do. This will add another um, another brick, I guess, in the foundation uh, on which our daily studies are based. And of course, I, I want to remind everyone that if you are um, interested and you want to go a little deeper, at the end of this uh, live session, we're going to join a special Zoom broadcast where you can really bring all your questions. I'm going to try to take questions here as well, but we don't have that much time for questions. So any and all questions you have, even on topics that are outside of what we're going to cover today here, you will be able to ask them and hopefully we'll be able to answer. So be sure to ask about the special Zoom connection and we'll have that right after this session. So uh, I'm very happy. I, I see friends here. We're live on uh, on YouTube and on Facebook. And I I know, uh, I see we have friends from all over the world. Some of you I know very well. Some of you are totally new. And this is exciting. Uh, hi from, uh, from Bogota, Colombia. We have friends from the... Uh, oh, uh, the the kingdom of Eswatini. I remember you. You were on my last uh, couple of explained as well. Uh, we have uh, Johnny from London and uh, Jean-Francois uh, from uh, Mexico. Great. And we have Sonia from Norway. And I'm just, it's amazing how something that really started as uh, uh, a feeling in one human being's heart over the years grew and evolved and uh, has reached uh, such a such a scale that it now touches hearts of people all over the world this is always amazing to me i apologize in advance my voice w was totally out last week so it's just coming back so i apologize if i am a little hard to understand i hope we can uh, we can work with it so uh the appearance of dre uh, well let, let me paint you a picture okay it all starts with the Torah. Oh, well, it starts before the Torah, actually. It starts with uh, a, a human, a person called Adam. Uh, and he was the first person to ask the question about the meaning of life. Why do we live? What's the meaning of it? What's the purpose? Why do I toil down here? Why do I suffer all these things? What, to just live for 70 years? It was probably way less back then. And then die, what have I accomplished? Where, where am I going? What's happening after I die? All those questions which everyone still carries with them to this day. That's a beautiful thing. Those are universal questions. And this person had them. And by asking those questions, 
by asking those questions, this person was, um, I'll say, I'll use the word granted just to make things easier. Remember, we're using human language, so we're limited, so everything sounds a little. So just work with me here. So this person started to ask these questions and was granted with a, a new feeling, a feeling that there is a higher force uh, that is governing everything, that is holding everything, that created everything with a certain purpose in mind. And uh, Adam was the first one, but certainly not the last to have that realization. He, like all Kabbalists, left uh, a book. He wrote a book. It was called Raziel HaMalach, Raziel the Angel. Angels in Kabbalah are simply forces. Forces of nature, like the angel of gravity or the angel of electricity, right? Just a force. The word angel sounds very evocative, and that's for a different session. Maybe we'll do a session on, on angels, because uh, it is an interesting one. But he wrote a book about everything that was revealed to him by this angel, by this force. Okay, a certain set of feelings and thoughts and ideas that all combined into one. It wasn't something that he imagined. It wasn't something that he uh, sort of um, arrived at logically. It was a complete realization, feeling, thinking, everything. Uh, and it felt to him as real as your body feels to you. And based on that, he started to uh, write this book. He gathered some students around him and taught them these ideas. And this continued for quite some time, but it was very much an individual affair. You know, a few people here and there that, that got this uh, wisdom, that awakened to this uh, idea that there is something bigger in this in this reality, something that is greater than just existing like an animal, something that allows you to become a human, Adam. So wh wh while we're all born as animals, more or less, and we learn the basics of human interaction, there's a still human interaction on the lowest level. Kabbalah, that thing that was revealed to the first person who got it, to Adam, was already a the beginning of a process by which anyone can become human, Adam. Adam from the word Dome, similar to the Creator, to the upper force in nature. So a lot of new terms, maybe for some of you, that's okay, just go with me. Put aside everything you know, or you think you know, or you've heard, maybe you come from the Christian tradition, or from any other traditions, just put those aside for now and just focus on that picture. You are awakened and you're given a method by which you can continue to grow and develop and become more like the upper force in nature. This process, as I explained, kept going until at some point in ancient Mesopotamia, sort of the cradle of modern civilization, one person again had this same feeling the same questions and th this person's name was abraham you probably heard of him as well and he was the first one to receive this kind of revelation this kind of sensation this attainment of the uh, higher picture in nature at a time where humanity was well developed living in uh, ancient babylon uh, many, many different sm clans, tribes, small nations, families, all living together, three million people, which was a lot at that time. And uh, Abraham's realization came at a time when uh, humanity underwent another a leap in development. The evolution of humanity is taking place in steps, in leaps. And that one of those leaps happened right there in Babylon. What evolved? The only thing that evolves, and that is the desire. We are all a desire to receive pleasure, and we are doing it with the intention to receive it for ourselves. And at that point in time, that desire to receive pleasure erupted, grew exponentially, and along with it, the intention to receive pleasure for yourself at the expense of everyone around you. So a society that lived relatively in, har in harmony, where people needed very little in order to exist and to communicate and to 
connect and to trade, suddenly we're faced with this feeling that they cannot really trust each other in the same way. It's almost like you wake up one morning and you don't recognize your brother, your sister, your cousin, your uncle. They all seem like strangers. They're all out to get you. You feel like you have to get them in order to take care of yourself. That sensation, that eruption of the ego was what tore this society apart. Groups of people started to leave. Abraham said, no, don't leave. Gather around me. I'll show you a method for how to do it. I'll instruct you. That instruction was the first time that it was given to a group of people. So unlike the small, tiny circles that studied that wisdom from the time of Adam until the time of Abraham, suddenly we had thousands of people who were open to this idea. And they were all just representatives of all the nations that lived in Babylon at the time. They followed Abraham, they left Babylon, and they formed the basis for the group that would later be known as the Jews, the Hebrews, Jews from the word Yehudi, from the word Yehud, unity, because they learned from Abraham that they have to unite, unite above these feelings, these uh, powers that were driving them apart. Abraham taught them this method, the method of a love that needs to cover all these crimes. Obviously, I'm giving you quick simplification ideas, taglines, but that in a sense is what he was teaching them. And that process of evolution of the desire and alongside it, that method continued from Abraham, just like it started and continued from from Adam, it continued from Abraham. And that nation grew in numbers, quantitatively and qualitatively, until they ended up in Egypt. Egypt is the was the um, the symbol of the biggest will to receive, the greatest uh, manifestation of the ego, of that egoistic desire. That was at that time the symbol of the greatest desire, with Pharaoh being the king of that desire, and. That group united through um, an entire ordeal, which you can read about, at least in a certain language in the Bible, the story of the Exodus from Egypt. And they came out of Egypt, and for the first time in human history, for the first time since the creation of the world, from the Big Bang and the evolution of all matter, and still matter, and vegetative life, and animate life, and human life, All of that finally came to a head around Mount Sinai in the desert where they agreed to be as one man in one heart and received the Torah, the Torah. That Torah from the word O, light, and from the word Hoa, instruction, is what these people received. It was the first time it was given to an entire nation. It wasn't one person who... uh, who had an idea, who had a thought, who had bits and pieces of something. It was a collective attainment. That's something that was never um, recorded before, never never happened before. And everything else from that moment on, from the receiving of the Torah and later the writing down of the book, the canonization of this instruction in a book that we know as the Torah, the Bible, these five books and the additional books around it, that was the, um, the cornerstone of this method. All the stories in the Bible, everything that it talks about, it talk about this method for attaining the highest force in nature, the force of the Creator. How? By reaching equivalence of form, by practicing love above the crimes. From that moment, the, these people lived, they reached uh, a certain level of connection, uh, exemplified, symbolized by the first temple that was built in Israel, and the second temple, and eventually they were dispersed. There was another great Kabbalist that wrote another commentary on this method. His name was Rashbi, and he wrote the Book of Zohar, which was concealed. And after that, humanity basically plunged into what we know collectively as the Dark Ages, medieval times, and they were truly dark. 
Uh, this, this were time of uh, great upheavals and wars and famine and plagues and uh, all manner of exploitation. Those, those were really dark times, uh, certainly in most of the world. Uh, you know, it, although there were a few exceptions, almost everyone was not having a great time. Let's put it this way. And this... Uh, this process of going through the dark was an important one because humanity was maturing. That was a process of maturation. And it was, it, it came to a, a certain, uh, a certain um, resolution at the time that we now refer to as the Renaissance. That was the beginning of a transformation coming out of these dark ages where knowledge was lost, where humanity was lost into a time where there was a suddenly a renewed um, appreciation of humanity. There was this new leap uh, in our evolution. The will to receive continued to grow, made another leap. And uh, suddenly there were these points of, of light, of exploration, great emotional development and the Renaissance also led, was really the transition from the Dark Ages into the Age of Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, where it was the, a time of great achievements, scientifically, politically, and socially. This was just a, a very brief timeline of the events. Now, in that time, uh, at the end of the 15th century, another big event happened, and that, that is the uh, expulsion of the Jews in Spain. Spain was, um, had become the center of Jewish life and of Jewish wisdom and Kabbalistic wisdom after the destruction of the Second Temple. Uh, again, without getting too much into the history, uh, after the destruction of the Temple, the first and the second Jews sort of left Israel, exiled into all different parts of the world, but gravitated eventually to Spain, which became, as I said, that the center of humanity at that time, the 15th century. Uh, there was uh, great coexistence with, uh, with, with the Muslims at the time. There was exploration, discovery of the world. Humanity was really expanding. There was a, a true sense of expansion. But at the height of that, <coughs> excuse me, the height of that time, there was also a, another um, shattering that took place, which was um, as big for the Jewish world and for the wisdom as the first and second temple uh, destruction. That was the expulsion from Spain. Without getting into why that happened, enough to suffice to say that after that expulsion, the, the, the people who left Spain a lot of them started gravitating toward Israel and toward Safed or Tzfat, as we call it in Israel in, in Hebrew. I'm not sure why it's called Safed. I didn't uh, research it. You're welcome to research it. Um, Kabbalists established their um, place in Tzfat. Now, we, if you follow us uh, regularly, you know we probably have seen the. The series called The Journey to the Land of Israel, it's, uh, it's a great one. I highly recommend you watch it because it gives a, a, a sort of a, uh, uh, a geographical review of the land of Israel according to the spiritual roots. Because that country also has, it, it, is, it is a corporeal branch of a spiritual root called the land of Israel. Land from the word Eretz, Ratzon, desire, and Israel from the words Yeshar El, straight to the Creator. This place became, for a reason, for a spiritual reason, the center, the new center of uh, all these Kabbalists, and specifically in the north of Israel, which corresponds to the Sphira of Chokhmah. Uh, again, our, our, our session today, Today is not about that, so I'm not going to go, you know, into great detail about about that. But Kabbalists felt attracted to that place that uh, and that that was the the, the it, it was a, a spiritual center for many years, for uh, you know uh, one and a half thousand years before that. 
uh, Rashbi, who wrote the Zohar with his, with his uh, ten, nine students, they sat in the cave uh, nearby. And uh, the beginning of the, um, the Mishnah and, and the, the Talmud, which, which came out of that, was there. Everything started from there. So it was no wonder that Kabbalists gravitated to that location. And in, indeed, uh, in Tzfat, if you were alive at that time, imagine the 15th, 16th century, this is the uh, rise of the Ottoman Empire. It's not the rise, it's already laid into the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Jews were able to um, study Kabbalah and, and explore uh, the wisdom with relative quiet, uh, and that's what they, they would they would do for f for many years. And in that place in Tzfat, uh, one name rose into prominence. His name was the Ramak. Ramak is Rabbi Moshe Kodovao. Uh, it's another acronym, uh, and he was uh, he, he was truly a, a prodigy, and he studied Kabbalah, he studied the book of Zohar, uh, he's said to have studied it, known it by heart, uh, and he sought to uh, systematize, uh, systematize, systemize, systematize, put the, the, the wisdom into a system. So you have to understand that the wisdom that you know of today is already the result of many, uh, let's call it incarnations, of, of the same ideas. Just as the human ego evolved throughout the ages, the wisdom of Kabbalah evolved next to it, almost leading the way for the will to receive because whenever someone awakened in their generation, they needed to have a wisdom that they can connect with and use it to attain spirituality, to attain the higher world, to attain the purpose of creation. And although there was not um, there was no uh, um, long-term exit strategy for Kabbalists who lived during the, the Dark Ages. Their purpose, their mission in life was to really preserve the wisdom, add a few layers to it, and pass it on to the next generation. That's all that they could have hoped for. But starting around the time of the Ramak, there was a, a new sense of uh, awakening. A sense that uh, people who study can now engage in the wisdom in its fullest in order to reach the end of correction, meaning the full correction, not simply the correction of the individual that is working with the method in order to correct their will to receive, to add a new intention on top of it, the intention to bestow, so they'll be able to form the correct connection with the Creator. And I'll get into it in, 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 uh, in a bit. But actually to bring about the general correction. And that's a, that was an important concept in Kabbalah that, as I said, in the 1500 years before it, was simply not on the table. Jews were in exile. The temples were destroyed. There was no central sense of uh, the wisdom and, uh, and a clear place where you could study or a, a way to really disseminate the wisdom and to share it with everyone far and wide. It was really limited to a select few. And the Ramak came and he decided to do it. And in 1550, he even uh, decides to uh, take it a step further and he establishes the first uh, Kabbalah Academy. And the Academy is very successful. He writes uh, a series of books uh, most notably uh, a book called Pardes Rimonim. Uh, you can see, I think, uh, no, that, that's not this book, the, the book on the, the page on the right. This one is from that book. And another book, uh, O Hayaka, which is a commentary on the book of Zohar. And a few other books that uh, prepare people to enter the wisdom. And the Ramak establishes this academy, and for 20 years he's leading the academy. He's the, he's the, uh, you know, he's the, uh, the the elder, although he's young, he's in his 40s, but he is leading this um, the endeavor to teach people to bring Kabbalists into the fold. 
but the books that they study are very, they're very very um, they have a very specific feel to them they are they were written in a certain way and the attainment of people at that time was also expressed in a very different way we're used to thinking of a science as something that i can take down i reach a certain discovery i write the formulas for it then i can take the formula and pass it to the next in line but kabbalah again is a science of yourself you study yourself and your relationship to the upper worlds which are revealed around you in the connection with others and so the level of development of the vessel of each person determines their ability to take these words to take this attainment and to actually translate it into something that you can pass so if you can think about it in uh, about yourself think about yourself uh, finding out something great for the first time and you're just amazed and you're full of excitement you're full of uh, you're full of um, you know you, 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 you're, you're just uh, you're full of feelings and emotions and sensations and you oh my my hairs are standing on end and my my my, my skin is tingling and my my eyes are bright and my heart is pounding and I and, and I feel this and I feel that right someone that you're trying to communicate it to will be like okay I can see you're excited but I don't know exactly what you're talking about right think about the first time you've done something truly amazing and you're trying to share it with your younger brother okay think of things like driving for the first time um, having uh, intimate relations for the first time um, maybe try you know drinking alcohol doing other things for the first time it's very hard to convey in words what's happening you know unless you're a chemist and you can explain look it's this molecule this ethanol connects with this molecule and then it makes this molecule do this right if I'm not a chemist I don't know what you're talking about all you have uh, to work with are your feelings and that's how Kabbalah books were really uh, written at the time they were, they were based on feelings so you can imagine they were very abstract they were very hard to connect to because if a feeling is something you can't really convey you can talk about it, but I'm not necessarily gonna be able to relate to your feeling exactly and I certainly will have a hard time recreating those feelings inside of me but that's the challenge that Kabbalists faced all throughout the generations and unless you spend uh, a great deal of time with a teacher and some students and really get into uh, to feel one another really closely it would be practically impossible to understand what's going on but that that's what people had to work with and so imagine that bef in, in around 1570 here, here's the story I, I want I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this story um, around 1570 the Ramak gathers his students and he says he says to them this way I shall soon leave this earth yet after my passing someone will replace me and even though many of that person's statements may seem to contradict mine do not oppose him do not argue with him for they stem from the same source as do mine and are absolutely true okay this is imagine your teacher is telling you this someone's gonna come he's gonna sound exactly the opposite but it's going to be the truth and he continues he says his soul is a spark of Shimon Bar Yochai Rashbi the Kabbalist who wrote the book of Zohar with his students and uh, whoever possesses uh, I'm sorry whoever opposes him opposes the Shekhinah the divinity the divine presence Shekhinah is the is the is the, is the corrected vessel in which the Creator is revealed and what is his name his students asked well I cannot tell you at this point he doesn't want um, <coughs> this uh, his identity to be known and he says this though I can say he who sees the cloud which at my funeral will precede my bed will be my successor okay? that's what the Ramak 
tells his students. Someone's going to come. It's going to be a great teacher. It's going to sound completely opposite than me, but you should follow him because he's the truth. And how will you know who he is? I can't tell you his name, but, uh, but, but uh, he, if he sees the cloud which will, which will precede my bed at my funeral, uh, this will be the guy. So all that information is coming to you. Uh, what do you do with it? Okay, sure enough, a few weeks later, uh, on the, on the, hold on. Wait, I'm sorry, I'm stuck. my screen is stuck here. Okay, uh, sure enough, a few weeks later, and um, he, he passes. Um, he passes on to, to the next part of his journey, and there's a funeral. Now, um, enter Diary. So I'm going to continue the story. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell you this. So Diary, uh, at that same time, a few weeks before that, a few months, I don't know, he comes to Tzfat. Uh, he grew up in Israel, then moved to Egypt, became a merchant, lived with his uncle, studied, and he comes to <coughs> he comes to Tzfat. And he joins, he asks, who's the, you know, biggest, uh, you know, sage here? I said, the Ramak. He goes, he joins the students there, and he does everything with them, very humbly, very modestly. And it's obviously, he doesn't want to be uh, known. But um, fast forward to the funeral, the day of the funeral comes, and, uh, you know, everybody, the community is, is mourning, everybody's devastated, the Ramak was truly a giant. And uh, at his funeral... Uh, which was attended by all the Jews in Tzfat at the time. Uh, many eulogies were recited, and um, uh, even among the eulogizers was Diary. Uh, Diary, who, again, we still don't know much about him, but I'm just giving you his, you know, his entrance act. And Diary also um, uh, talks about the Ramak and describing him as totally free of sin, Someone so righteous, so pure, and everybody was crying, and everybody was uh, walking after his, the bears of his bed that they were carrying to, to be buried. And uh, they reached the cemetery, and they continued walking for a long while until they reached a certain site. And then they turned to the crowd and said, we shall bury him here beside one of Israel's greatest sages. Was one of the sages from the Mishnah, the old sages. However, um, the Ari stopped them. He rushes before the crowd and says, "No, no, no! Don't do it! Don't bury him here. There's the cloud which is preceding him has continued on its path. Surely it will indicate where the Ramak desires to be buried." And so everybody heard these words, were stunned, naturally, right? And now they knew the identity of their new teacher. And that very day, uh, the Ari's name uh, began to spread and, uh, and people started to cluster around him. And the Ari uh, was truly a, 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 a phenomenon. First of all, he was younger than Deramak, and he, he was unknown. He was an unknown figure. He came from Egypt. Nobody knew exactly how he attained, what he attained, but he started to teach. And the difference from the Ari to the Ramak was remarkable. It wasn't a gentle evolution as it was before from teacher to student, student to you know, teacher to student. It was a completely new way of looking at things. And just to give you a taste of um, what, what it's about, I, I hope you can read it. I'm going to read it here from my end. So, here's a bit of text from the Ramak on the left, okay? He writes in one of his books, I said, and this is the, one of the easiest, I chose an easy text just to... He writes like that, Without a doubt, it's concerning these men and their like that King Solomon, peace upon him, said, The fool does not desire understanding, but only to air his thoughts. It is apparent that one who follows his desires and spurns enlightenment in the mysteries of the Torah can be called a fool. 
since he continues his folly and his intoxication with his lowly world. The verse states, The fool does not desire understanding. These are the esoteric subjects hidden within the exoteric matter. This definition of understanding is the one which the sages, their memory be a blessing, used when they said, He who understands one thing from another. I could barely understand anything from this, uh, and it's not unusual, as I said, very specific style of writing. On the right, you have an excerpt from one of the writings the are left. Uh, and I'll read you that just for comparison. There he writes, the purpose and intention behind the creation of the worlds is now explained in two inquiries that have been dealt with by scholars throughout history. The first inquiry is what early and later scholars have explored in order to understand the reason for the creation of the worlds, to what end it was made. They concluded that the reason for this was because it was necessary for God, may he be blessed, to be complete in all his actions, powers, and names of greatness and glory. If his actions and powers were not actualized through action and deed, he would not be considered complete in his actions, powers, and names, so to speak. So, already a much clearer style of writing. And this is just one tiny excerpt. When you delve into the writings of DRE, you begin to see the effort that he put into articulating his words. But it wasn't simply a style of writing. It was also the ideas that he brought uh, to the table. The Ari was the first one to, um, to start talking about new concepts, the concept of the Tsimtsum, the restriction, and as importantly, the concept of light, vessel, and screen, or all Kli, Masach, maybe just uh, just for the sake of, for those of you who are new to this, the, the Ari was the first one who described uh, who described the the created being in in the form of in the form of a vessel, a kli vessel or a kli, a desire to receive pleasure minus an empty place, and the light of the Creator, and so infinity Creator as something that wants to fill this Kli. Uh, I should write <coughs> probably light like this, just so it's clear, or, okay, light. That's the big plus. And the Klee's ability to receive the light is dependent upon the ability of the vessel to create a screen. Or masach in Hebrew. And it's this relationship that allows the Klee, the created being, uh, Eventually, it will be us as well. But even before there were us or anything, there was this condition of a created being that is able to receive light from the Creator. A certain amount of light by adding this screen, which was, which was the intention, the correct intention, on top of this screen. Uh, vessel this Kli, which is the which is the matter okay the form so these these concepts of sorry the matter the vessel the Kli, and the and then the and then the screen the intention the form and the light the, that interacts and fills them inner light and then surrounding light that remains on the outside
again, if you've been studying with us, this is not new. But if if you if if this is the first time you're seeing this, any mention of Kabbalah today will use these concepts that simply did not exist. So the Ari was um, in in this lineage of Kabbalists. <laughs> That dates back to, as I said, Moses, then Rashbi and the Zohar, Moses and the Torah, Rashbi and the Zohar, the Ari, and the late 16th century, then the Baal Shem Tov, which continues that uh, with the Hasidic movement uh, and the, his approach to study the teaching Kabbalah, and eventually Baal Sulam, uh, here, there you go, oh, Baal Sulam in the 1900s, and the Kabbalah that we have today. They're all a direct line that we call Lurianic Kabbalah because up until the Ari, you could find any manners of uh, learning, of approaching the wisdom, and he was the first one to use the language that would later be associated with the Age of Reason, with the Enlightenment, with the scientific thought. So he is, his work actually preceded some would say even motivated um, from within this um, huge leap in the way humans, uh, human consciousness uh, behaves and perceives reality. But that wasn't the only thing that they read. By the way, I, I don't know if you have questions. Let's see. Uh, oh, those are all our questions. From Kevin, Veronica, Rose of Zion, uh, H.C., Okay, uh, let me do a couple of more things and then I'll take questions. Okay, I promise, I promise questions. There will be questions. Will be questions. Uh, so, where are we? So, the Ari uh, didn't simply uh, just rearrange, systematized the wisdom as the Ramak had dreamt of doing, but the Ari is actually able to do it, including adding concepts that were missing from the uh, wisdom before him. He also added a few interesting things. Now, a few just side notes about the Ari. We can talk a whole hour just on the Ari's sort of approach and attitude, but it was important for me to give you the context. Uh, unlike many Kabbalists, the Ari himself did not write. The Ari died oh, two years after he, sh he, he uh, assumed his role. In the two years that he was alive and teaching, he brought us the Etz Chaim, and Shagil Gulim, these two books, The Gate of Incarnations and Tree of Life, these two uh, um, works really uh, created the entire foundation for for modern day Kabbalah and for our <coughs> our ability to work with the Book of Zohar, which in itself again is a commentary on the Torah, which was the first canonization, complete organization of the method. So this was a, an extremely important uh, event and the fact that this one person was able to do it and not even writing it himself, rather everything was written by his student Chaim Vital, uh, Marchu. You sometimes hear his name shortened like that, Marchu. Morenu Rabenu Chaim Vital. Chaim Vital was who was um, the, the successor of the Ari. Uh, but the Ari also gave additional stipulations to the study. Let's see. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay. What did he say? He said... What? There it is. He said the following, and this is Chaim Vital, writing in the book of uh, in, um, um, reincarnations. My teacher cautioned me and all the friends who were with him in that society to take upon ourselves the commandment to do love of love your neighbor as yourself and to aim to love each one from Israel as his own soul. For by this, his prayer would rise comprising all of Israel and will be able to ascend and make a correction above, especially our love of friends. Each and every one of us should include himself as though he is an organ of those friends. 
my teacher sternly cautioned me about this matter. So the Ari didn't just give uh, his students, uh, uh, you know, newly uh, edited uh, formulas. That wasn't what this wisdom was about, because it's the wisdom of the heart. Kabbalah is the wisdom of how to change me, myself, my desires, from egoistic desires, from receiving in order to receive, from perceiving reality in this inward motion only to me and for me at the expense of anything and everything, very limited, finite perception, into something infinite that lives outside of me in the connection with others. And that was the instruction of the Ari to the students, to start behaving in this way, to that to the love of friends that each and every one of us should include himself as though he is an organ of those friends, no less. And the other thing that the Ari did was the following, I'm reading, my teacher, would say that the heart of the intention of reading in the Torah depends on aiming to connect one's heart to its root through the Torah in order to complete the upper tree and complete the upper Adam and correct him. For this is the whole purpose of man's creation and the purpose of his engagement in the Torah. So that not only did the Ari give them the, the, the system of the worlds, he gave him the condition of love, and he gave him the intention of reaching that goal, which is the goal of the wisdom of Kabbalah. Without those two things, without connection and intention, a person cannot study Kabbalah. You can engage with the wisdom, you can learn some great new ideas, you can memorize some cool one-liners, I don't know. You can make beautiful graphs and charts, uh, the like of which no one has seen before. You can make a few party tricks, but you cannot reach attainment. To reach attainment, you need to have these, these conditions in place. Let's take a couple of questions. All right. Um, never was. That's a great name. I have a question. If a picture is worth a thousand words, how does sh how does one how does sh show one word? I do not understand this question. I'm sorry. It never was. Maybe you can re restate the question. Maybe the team can help help him. Um, okay. Never was asking. Also, what does Torah mean in the science? So as I, I think about probably an earlier question, Torah is, uh, is the instruction, it's the, it's the light, it's the quality that we, uh, that we connect to um, in order to connect to the Creator. This is the, um, it's the, the adapter, uh, if, if you will. It's where everything happens, is the Torah. Because it, it is like the system <laughs> that exists and we fill that system when we correct ourselves. So it is part, it is a central part of the science because without it, without uh, relating to that, without developing the desire to really know what's written there, not just understanding it with our beastly minds, by desiring to connect to that, we begin to draw the reforming light. And that's another central concept in Kabbalah. Without the light, you cannot change. You cannot change simply by regurgitating ideas. You have to draw some external force, the same force that created you as an egoist, to come and change your intention to be an altruist. So you can be in the right connection with the upper force. Uh, HD is asking, is this Adam that Adam? Uh, I guess, I think you're referring to Adam from the Bible. So we won't have time to get into it, uh, but there's a there's a biblical story uh, which put put it aside for now. Uh, there's a system called Adam. Okay, so in Kabbalah we talk about systems that were created. So before the existence of this corporeal world, there were the the upper worlds that Kabbalah describes, and they sort of exist before space, time, and motion. It's hard for it to grasp. We can talk about it. 
doesn't make a lot of sense. But understand that there is before her, before this floor, there was a foundational floor, if you will, okay? And that, that floor exists, you know, in that floor exists the blueprint for this floor. There's a spiritual root or blueprint, and then there's a corporeal version of that, if you if you will. And the same forces operate in, in those places, but it's a system here that we exist in that is more removed from the light. There's way, way less light here, meaning everything is uncorrected here. Everybody's acting egoistically, <coughs> to put it in very simple terms. And so we, we cannot experience that corrected system. In fact, there are five degrees of concealment between this level where we're at and the fully corrected system where you have complete revelation of the Creator, feeling of His presence, of this upper force of love. So Adam was a system that was created within the system of the worlds to allow the, uh, uh, this very specific kind of vessel to engage in correction. And then the biblical story gives you a, sim a symbolic account of these events okay, that took place 6,000 years ago when a person named Adam woke up one day and realized these things. But they're all interconnected, so you can't really separate them, but you also can't look at the Bible as some sort of historic document. I, I realize that it's maybe a little confusing, uh, again, I know we have we have a couple of experts simply specifically on those things. You should probably um, look into that as well. Um, Veronica, hello from Canada. How to apply and use these three words, light and Torah? Uh, so, okay, so we touched on it when we um, when we uh, introduced the vessel. Uh, the way to do it is you enter once you learn the foundation, you enter a group. And you begin to study exactly that. How do I? How do we build a vessel in the connection between us? So the vessel is not me. Rather, it's something that's created in the connection between us. And how do we take this vessel and we orient it? We correct it a certain way. We keep the ego out of it. We only f feed it with our intention to bestow and our actions of bestowal. And by that, we begin to resemble the upper force of love and we begin to draw that light, the light of Torah, into it. So that's, again, a very, very brief explanation on that. Rose of Zion, Wisdom. Is there a link where we can watch the journey to the land of Israel? Yes, on Kabbalah Info, or, I mean, on, on, on the Kabbalah... I mean, actually, here on this YouTube, where you're watching the live, you, you will find it. Maybe the team can help you find it. It's called Journey to the Land of Israel. Uh, Veronica again asking how do Kabbalists use these three different words or okay the same thing aren't we very far from the original point of receiving the Torah is it even the same thing so I'll just say this we um, um, we are living in a very interesting time uh, it's not the mid the, the dark ages uh, and it's not this this time of us uh, of, of uh, the awakening of humanity. Humanity is really already uh, in, inside the process of awakening, awakening to what Kabbalists call the revelation of evil. We're starting to recognize what's the source of all the bad things we see. Human ego. Unchecked ego will just go after everything and everyone. Uh, food, sex, family are corrupted, money, honor, power, corrupted, knowledge, corrupted, all those uh, human desires, animal and human desires that exist in us, they're all misused. They're used to fill ourselves more and more at the expense of everything and everyone, and the results are plain to see. And so humanity is at a point where it's beginning to realize who's the real enemy that we need to be fighting. We're still not there in terms of uniting, banding together against it, but that's why you guys are here. If you're listening to this, you're here. <coughs> and I want to say that um, Bala Sulam, who continued this, um, this, this work and really packaged this wisdom specifically for our generation, for really for the 20th century, for the, for the cold ego, calculating... Uh, uh, human ego, uh, he uh, and we study mostly the writings of Bala Sulam and of his successor and son, the Rabash. 
together they cover all these um, aspects of the wisdom from both from above down how the worlds really came to be in the system arrange itself to bring us to where we are and from below up how we gather in a group and we begin to apply these 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 same principles to resemble the upper force these are these two Kabbalists of Baal Sulam writes know for certain the sense the time of DRE to this day there has not been anyone who understood the method of DRE to the fullest as it was easier to attain a mind twice as great and twice as holy than the Aris, then to understand his method in which many hands fiddled, from the one who first heard and wrote them through the last compilers, while they still did not attain the matters as they are in their upper root. Thus each inverted and confused the matters, and now, by the Creator's will, I have been rewarded with a conception or an impregnation of the soul of the Ari, not because of my good deeds, he writes, but by a higher will. It is beyond me too why I have been chosen for this wonderful soul with which no one has been granted since his passing until today. I cannot elaborate on this matter as it is not my way to discuss the concealed. So Baal Salam here gives us a little clue. He doesn't write this way at all. Usually you won't find um, this type of writing in his in, in everything that he wrote, but he left a little clue as to um, what's... Um, what he was able to accomplish because the generation is becoming worthy of that <coughs> and uh, the uh, you have to understand that the oh, sorry the Ari um, when it was time for him to leave he called Chaim Vital and he told him listen none of you guys did follow my instruction fully and I'm now therefore I am uh, forbidding anyone to engage in the wisdom but you, and you should only do it, you know, in secret. He basically told everyone, uh, after everything I gave you, you're not to engage in it because you're just corrupting it, as Baal Sulam wrote. You will just engage in it, you will take it down, write it down properly, and that is it. And the Ari, in fact, uh, um, you know, um, just as he's on his deathbed and is about to die. Uh, they, they say to him, his, his, uh, his other student comes in and says, how, you know, and there he says, I'm sorry, he says, I will come and teach you the rest of the wisdom. And one of his students says, how, how will you teach us? Uh, and there he says, quiet, you have no business in the concealed. Um, because when a person is in attainment, the death of the physical teacher is not a barrier to continue this connection. Because that's what this wisdom is all about. It's about forming these connections which live above, <coughs> in a level above that of the physical body. They live on a spiritual level, a level that is eternal, is not bound by the, uh, the different clothings, physical clothings of the physical body. So that's the beautiful thing of the Ari. I wanted to read you also part of the... Um, his song is beautiful, the beautiful song that he wrote. Uh, but you can, f you can, you know, he wrote a poem. Uh, maybe I'll read you just one. I'll, I'll leave you with that and invite you to the special Zoom that we have, where we can answer more questions uh, on the RE and anything around it. And so um, uh, I will just say that it's been uh, it's been great to be back because I haven't been here for a while and I, I forgot how quickly time passes. But if you have the time, if it's Sunday afternoon somewhere for you and you have the day off, come join us on the Zoom. You don't have to know anything. You just open your camera or type in your question or ask your question and we'll answer it. It's great. A lot of great people there. Everybody who was like you before, just a year ago, maybe they were also here, like looking at the screen, not knowing half of the stuff that I mentioned. But they came, they learned, and they and they and they know. So that's the best way to do is to to just ask. So I'll leave you with this um, um, one verse from from our, the Ari's poem, which he writes at the beginning uh, of the study of the Ten uh, I mean, it's it's written in the beginning of Etz Chaim, which is what Baal Sulam turned into the study of the Ten Sfirot, which is one of the important books that we study from. So he writes like that, Behold, 
that before the emanations were emanated and the creatures were created, the upper simple light had filled the whole existence. And there was no vacancy, such as an empty air or a hollow, but all was filled with that simple, boundless light. And there was no such part as head or end, but everything was one simple light, balanced evenly and equally, and it was called the light of Ensof, infinity. And when upon his simple will came the desire to create the worlds and emanate the emanations, to bring to light the perfection of his deeds, his names, his appellations, which was the cause of the creation of the worlds, then the Ein Sof restricted himself in his middle point, precisely at the center, and he restricted that light and drew far off to the sides around that middle point. And when upon his simple will came the desire to create the worlds and emanate the emanations, oh, I'm sorry, and there remained an empty space, an empty air, a vacuum, precisely from the middle point. And that restriction was equally around that empty middle point, so that the space was evenly circled around it. And after the restriction, when the vacant space remained empty, precisely in the middle of the light of Ensof, a place was formed where the emanations, creations, formations, and actions might reside. Then, from the light of Ensof, a single line hung down from above, lowered into that space. And through that line, he emanated, created, formed, and made all the worlds. Prior to these four worlds, there was one light of Ensof, whose name is one in wondrous hidden unity. And even in the angels closest to him, there is no force and no attainment in the Ein Sof, and there is no mind of a created that could attain him, for he has no place, no boundary, no name. This is it. I hope you enjoyed. Kabbalah explained simply. Uh, see you all here uh, next time, and I'll see the rest of you on the Zoom. Thank you.